Hi everyone, and welcome back to Internet Report's bi-weekly Pulse update, where we keep our finger on the pulse of how the internet is holding up week over week. And what an eventful two weeks has been. Today we'll be discussing insights from recent data center related incidents at Microsoft and Oracle, and explore how IT teams can minimize downtime in situations like these. We're also gonna cover other outages that happened everywhere from Twitter to Tesla. And with so many interesting things to cover, we're piloting a new segment of the podcast I'm calling The Download, my TLDR summary of what you absolutely need to know about the internet this week in two minutes or less, or even quicker if I speak faster. As I mentioned, in a space for a week, we saw two data center related outages at Microsoft and Oracle that lasted for quite a while. These outages underscored the importance of quickly determining whether a safe and graceful failover and or shutdown is possible in the event of a data center issue. So stay tuned for more on these outages later in the episode. We also observed outages at Twitter, Atlassian, Fitbit, and Tesla. The Tesla app outage is one I definitely want to discuss further as it's important implications for companies as more and more cars rely on apps and subscription services to power all kinds of features. In Tesla's case, due to the outage that impacted the Tesla app, car owners were unable to lock or unlock their vehicles or find charging stations using the app. Thankfully, customers are still able to access their car with their physical key cards. Who would have thought that? But the incident is still a reminder of how critical it is for companies to guard against back-end issues like this as cars become increasingly reliant on the apps and the internet. Uh, we'll discuss this a bit further later in the episode, but I also want to chat more about the events at Twitter, Atlassian, and Fitbit. Looking at the overall trends, one interesting data point we noticed was that the US outages represent a much smaller percentage of global outages than we saw this time last year. Overall outage numbers are increasing, both globally and in the US, but US-centric outages only accounted for 21% of all observed outages, this is down from 43% the same period in 2022. It's going to be interesting to see if that trend continues to progress through 2023. And now let's dive further into trends we're seeing and further explore some of the recent outages observed. As always, I've included chapter links in the description box so you can skip ahead to the sections that are most interesting to you. We'd also love for you to hit like and subscribe and always feel free to email us at internetreport at thousandice.com. We welcome your feedback and questions. And to discuss all of this, I'd like to welcome back Brian Tobia, Lead Technical Market Engineer at Thousand Eyes. Brian, it's great to have you back. How have you been, mate? Thanks, Mike. Doing well. Good to be here again. All right. Then let's take a look at the numbers this week. What I really wanted to sort of uh, talk about and focus on there is this. If I look at the percentage of US-centric uh, um, outages that are there, so it's dropped from 43% to 21% if I compare it to last period last year. Right? So I'm actually looking at sort of these two-week period and the same two-week period last year. Now, here's my, my theory on this, is that what we're starting to see from there is that uh, the as we make a change to a, to a, a network, so we talked about this, you know, you said as these, these windows coming in from a change perspective, uh, and this sort of accounts for an outage point of view we're seeing from there. As we're... Um, as we're moving into th this uh, th this reduced area, what we're seeing is uh, I make a change is not having so much of a cascading effect you talked about. So I'm able to isolate that change as it were and see my 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 uh, my blast radius, my impact zone is sort of far less from there. So therefore, although the outage numbers are increasing, what I'm actually seeing there is this from a from a US centric perspective. I said they're also increasing in terms of numbers, but they're not having as great a global effect. So if my point is, if I take an interface down that's connected to another interface down here in, in Australia, then obviously see two outages from there. But what I'm starting to believe is that we've been able to isolate those sort of further control, if it were, that outages. Um, does that make sense or uh, do you think I'm completely off the rails? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it totally makes sense. And I think another point of that is companies are realizing that these outages are happening. So we're kind of deploying to more regions and to more global areas and by segmenting those changes just like you're saying to different areas or a single change that may affect only one network interface or one availability zone we're we're not seeing these on a global scale as much now so we you know we can i think it's really helping with how these are uh, the distribution of these and like you were saying you know how the what the blast radius is how much it's actually affecting we're still seeing outages but i think spreading that out and then again where where things are deployed is really playing a you know a big impact into that yeah, absolutely, yeah. And we're always going to see outages that we talked about from there. Okay, so that's really interesting to see how that's going to evolve over the, the rest of the year. Uh, but now let's discuss some of the outages from the past couple of weeks as we go under the hood. All right, so we're going to start with two day centre outages. But before we move on to those, uh, just want to say uh, 
uh, if you hear some noise in the background, uh, I've just been uh, visited by a whole flock of cockatoos, uh, the joys of living in the uh, outback. All right. So as I said, let's go to start with these two data center outages. So while the data centers and cloud workloads, they host drive for always on availability uh, and maximum uptime, there are occasions when things are going to go wrong. Uh, it often starts with power availability. Um, and when power is uneven or unavailable, they, what we have to do or what teams have to do is to determine uh, whether a safe or graceful failover and shutdown is possible. Obviously, if we actually able to shut it down um, gracefully, then we, we, we reduce that risk of uh, damaging sort of data within our system uh, from there as well. We also got to make sure what actually sort of uh, is going to be shut down. If we take out a critical service or an aggregating point, obviously we're going to have sort of uh, uh, major issues. So on February the 7th, Microsoft experienced a data center cooling event. Uh, this is in Southeast Asia. Um, and a mains, it was caused by a mains brownout led to several chillers. So these are units that provide the cooling to the data center, uh, and these actually shut down. Uh, this reportedly caused difficulty from some customers, particularly in this region, so in Southeast Asia, accessing a wide variety of cloud services, including Teams and many Azure services. And the disruption actually extended quite along. It sort of lasted around 32 hours. And we talk about disruption, that was sort of uh, coming on and off the system to be able to do from there. So. What we saw from this is a couple of things, really. So Microsoft identified that the chillers tripped out due to a voltage uh, dip. It only affected a single availability zone. Um, but the, the whole power management system they had in place was designed to uh, cope with these sort of shutdowns. But what happened was this particular instance, we had this sort of cascading effect, and it was just a subset of these chillers went in. Uh, so then without enough cooling, obviously the ambient temperature in a data center is going to rise and we're going to risk damaging all these uh, this equipment in from there. So this is what I'm saying. They had to make this choice to actually shut things down there, uh, Brian. So when you actually go to this system, um, you know, we've talked about or I've talked about this this aspect of having a control system. What are you going to do to sort of make decisions? How how, how would you propose we're looking at this to, to decide what, what we shut down? You know, what stays, what goes type of thing? Yeah, that's an interesting point. I, I think well, one is I think it's important to test, right? So to understand what those shutdown procedures are and maybe have kind of a list and understand what what's what things are easier to to you know maybe bring down if necessary or what things are replicated or in different regions. So I think the availability and, and the what where the different pieces live and how easy those are to either bring back or to fail over uh, to to different infrastructure deployed in a different area. I think you kind of need to make that checklist uh, to help understand you know and make informed decisions rather than yeah just let's start setting some applications or servers off because uh you know because of a power or a cooling issue we, we've seen these a lot so i think it be i think it really comes down to that yeah that's actually really interesting so so it's it's not just the ability to shut them down what can we take down so what is our going point but also as you said what is it to actually bring us back up again uh, you know how quickly can we restore those um and, and you know obviously part of this as well is that again these things happen so we have plans in place and obviously, then once we experience something like this, you can actually go through and learn from it again. Ah, we thought that was a critical piece. It wasn't, yep. or it took an hour to come back up online. Yeah. So Microsoft wasn't the only cloud provider to, to experience the data center issues in February. Uh, on February the 14th, um, a good day for all of us to remember, Oracle had a separate issue, uh, this time with NetSuite. So the NetSuite is the Oracle owned provider of uh, ERP and CRM software. So this was reportedly due to a possible electrical fire at a third party uh, facility hosting NetSuite infrastructure actually in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, so right in your, your zone, Brian. Um, and again, this led to a controlled shutdown uh, and evacuation of the site. Again, this was a, a lengthy period of time. It was sort of almost off for 24 hours, uh, according to reports we've seen around from there. So a couple of points here. Um, the, the first one, again, sort of going back to your point about understanding what we need to shut down. In this case, we've got to take the whole data center down or the whole facility down at that area there. Uh, but the localized uh, nature of it meant that the impact was only seen for sort of the users relying in that that uh, that service uh, or, or that region, I should say, around from there. So those are the, uh, the people impacted the most. And they were sort of logging on. Um, but it does appear that there was some um, ability to sort of switch services and to be able to switch to some sort of disaster recovery site around, around from there. Um, but what, once the power is restored, Brian, what about this situation of um, uh, bringing the services back up? How can we be sure, basically, that we're, we're not doing anything in terms of sort of uh, uh, corrupting data or having these gaps, you know, as we're cutting them back across from a disaster recovery site? Yeah, I think 
Yeah, I, th- I think it's really important to be able to have testing in place to to know what an application looks like, you know, what's a good steady state. So as you bring things up, what does that look like? Are we seeing good data coming through? You know, have API connections or have API tests in place to make sure that's looking right and then have it documented too as you bring things up because I think we've seen that before where it's not just the outage that's a problem. It's actually once the outage is, you know, once the, let's say, network connectivity is restored, then we see additional impacts because when you bring things back up, whether it's a control plane not acting properly or like you mentioned data not coming or you know not being totally there i think that's when we start to see impact so it's it's important all, all really good points uh, that, that we've seen from there in addition to these data center related incidents at microsoft and oracle we observed other outages over the past couple of weeks that had a long duration or large geographical impact and in some cases both so we've been observing twitter for some time uh, given the recent major change of the company and although the infrastructure and architecture have proven to be resilient so far the application itself has experienced some glitches. So on February the 9th, some Twitter users reported being erroneously greeted with warnings that they were over the daily limit for sending tweets and will be restricted from tweeting more anymore. Uh, the limit is around uh, 2,400 a day and users also reported encountering messages that they breached other limits, such as the amount of people they could follow each day. Uh, and they were sort of the, these errors coming back. So, so what we saw here was more of a functional outage and availability or reachability outage. So we can always get to it from there. Um, but it, it, I think it's important to point out that any functional issue within a platform uh, you know, typically points to an application issue. Uh, but how can we go about sort of you know, identifying essentially that we are looking at a particular function within there um, that, that's causing that? Uh, and also really, I suppose, sort of breaking down that, that it's not uh, an issue specifically with the connectivity or it's not something for a, a data center or an infrastructure point of view, I guess what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and I think we're going to look at that uh, coming in another example, but I think one of the things important to test is mm. testing full stack, right? So all the way from the network up to the application itself. So as you know, to your point, if the network looks good, we can make a connection that doesn't necessarily mean the application's available. Uh, so, you know, we have to look for what's the HTTP request look like, or even to your case, right? It's You can even do something like a transaction test, even and make sure that yeah. what behavior you're expecting. So if I click on something, I'm expecting to see a certain status page or a certain uh, response back. If you want to, you know, if you really need to understand what the app is doing, you can set up a test, interact like a user, use something like browser synthetics to actually be able to pull that kind of data back and understand where is the problem. You know, is it network or is it all the way up to, like you mentioned, you know, over the character limit or some sort of application error that's not functioning properly? Yeah, so that, that that's good. So so we, we you're basically looking to test the functionality of it from a usability perspective. Exactly. So from a, for network there. So yeah, that that that's really interesting. Now, because the thing we have to remember here is that these breaches, breakages, and glitches, uh, you know, are, are more likely to become more more common. You know, we, we're living in this agile world. We're we're constructing uh, more applications by using APIs, different microservices, third party areas from there. Any one sort of change could actually sort of come into there. Which, which goes back to your earlier point, I guess, around the fact that, um, uh, you know, you want to be able to do the, the full set, but you also be able to understand all the components that are within that delivery chain. Exactly. All right. So let's move on to the next outage, February the 15th, around uh, 5 past 9, 9.04 a.m. Uh, UTC. Atlassian um, appeared to experience an outage that impacted access to some of its services. So we observed the duration around 50 minutes that impacted all region. So Brian, um, let's take a more detailed look at this. All right, yeah, so we're looking at an Internet Insight snapshot view here, uh, looking at the Alassian services, as you had mentioned, um, starting around 9.05 UTC. And what this is highlighting for us is that we saw global availability drop to the different services. So with, within Thousand Eyes, we test from all different locations. You can see on the left, we have vantage points in the U.S., the U.K., uh, Canada, you know, all, all across. And we can see that these are all in red, red. Red is bad, obviously, here. So if I click on uh, the, the 21 over at Lassian here, you can actually see that we'll expand it out uh, that, that we have 21 affected servers with that specific, uh, tied to that specific domain. And then we actually saw, and you can see here, HTTP response code error type. So it's actually telling us what we actually saw that was wrong. So at a quick glance, you can use something like Thousand Eyes, like our outage map as well, and you can identify you know, what exactly went wrong. So in this case, we saw, again, global reachability that dropped uh, from, you know, from the different vantage points to these services. Yeah, and back to my patterns again, we also see if, if we look at that timeline above there, you're sort of seeing the almost almost lights on, lights off type yeah. of scenario, which yeah. which I think we'll, we'll we'll get to. But yeah, 
Yeah, great, great point. So now we're looking at a more detailed view of the test itself to the JIRA application, which is one of the, the uh, applications hosted on their infrastructure. And this is an example of a page load test. So we're actually looking at, and this goes back to our point before about the full stack observability, right? Uh, or you're looking at the full transaction. So we profile everything from the initial DNS request all the way up to actually that page load. And you can see, uh, you know, again, that dip in performance. So we're looking at availability. The green obviously is good. Uh, so we're at 100%. And then during that uh, that outage that we identified, right, that's where the dip goes to 0%. And we're seeing from a global standpoint, you can see on the map below, all those different agents we're collecting from. And the data they were getting back obviously was a failure here. But what's really interesting, I think, is to look at the different phases of this. So, for instance, if I go over to our network view, which is called path visualization, we'll notice that the connection was actually fine. So the network in this case was, yep. was perfectly fine, right? We've got all our agents on the left. You can see everything's green connecting to their services. And if you were just monitoring at a network standpoint, you would not have caught this. You would have said, yeah, everything looks good. I could connect to their servers from the network, right? Everything was good. But as we know, that's not the case here. So instead, we can switch over to something like the HTTP view, and this is going to tell a much different story. So if I click on table view, we're now going to see what we got back. And here's all those 503 errors, right? And this is where the problem was, uh, um, you know, not not on the network side, but, you know, here's here's the actual HTTP errors that we were getting for all those different agents, agents trying to grab uh, their connection to Jira. Yeah, and uh, that's, that's good. And I, and I think one of the other things here is, again, we've already shown the network path is uh, is there and it's, it's available. Uh, but the fact we're getting a 503, is indicative of this server size. So we're getting something coming back from there. So as we said, from the application uh, perspective, so service unavailable. So it's making some, or we can assume it's making some sort of onward call because we're getting to the front door, which again, I think sort of underlines that point you're making earlier about testing that transaction stack right yeah. through, not just knocking on the front door, understanding what goes right through. All right, so th there's been no explanation so far sort of provided about this and that, that's fine. So, and there was also not a lot of chatter coming around from there, um, but it, it's, so there may have been something sort of in the background went from that one there that sort of it wasn't overly impacted. It might have been because this time of day something was taken down there, but it was it was a a, a fairly length of time. But also the fact we had this sort of on off, uh, it may well have been yeah. some sort of maintenance exercise. But again, this understands the importance of sort of understand that entire service delivery chain, uh, so that we can see the dependencies into into connections. Um, so you know, as we we're talking about right back to the very beginning of the numbers. If I can minimize that footprint of where my uh, my blast radius is going to be, exactly. Well, thanks, Brian. So let's move on to the next outage, um, and this one's kind of interesting. Not too much to show, but it's a a Tesla app outage in Europe um, garnered a lot of attention around from there. With car owners unable to lock or unlock their vehicles or, or find charging stations with the app, uh, yeah, critical thing. It's like um, <laughs> actually. Uh, my <laughs> Had an issue the other day uh, with 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 someone who remained norm, nameless, but it's my daughter who uh, the battery had gone in our, our our remote for the, the the car door, so she couldn't unlock the car until I showed her how the actual key worked. So, but you know this <laughs> a similar type of thing. So the the the, the issue affected sort of people outside of North America, so it's mainly a, a European thing. So the outage itself, like I said, there's ways to work around it. We could actually just put the key in the door. You know, we could remember where the charging stations were. But but the reason why I sort of highlighted around from there is is again to sort of uh, talk around the, the fact now we're relying on the internet to be able to yeah. pass these things around from there. There's these back end issues. Uh, you know, it becomes in, really important to understand what's going on uh, from from that area. Yeah, and I think we've seen these sometimes too, like with maybe like how connected homes too, right? Like doorbells and security yeah. cameras and, and locks even. I think we, we rely so much on it that, yeah, you need to understand where these outages are and how they might affect you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So on that same theme, um, users of Fitbit also encountered some uh, consecutive syncing issues between the devices and the mobile app. Again, this sort of extended over a 24-hour period. Uh, the issue, again, appears to be some kind of back-end or application issue, um, and the company have since said they've actually resolved this problem. Uh, you know, again, around from here, what the, the thing from this is that they, they reported the issues. They couldn't sync. They couldn't uh, access third-party applications. The integrations were failing. Uh, they couldn't get onto the Fitbit forums to uh, sort of say around from this. Um, it didn't stop the actual watch functioning, right? So you actually still function the watch. You're still doing a step count around from there. But I couldn't do in its sync. So 
you know, again, we're talking about a, a, a complex system or, or a system that has multiple components to it and sort of back ends. You know, we're connecting over the internet again for some of this, um, uh, to the syncing stuff from there. But any one component of that chain, everything was functioning in isolation, but we couldn't put everything together uh, for, for, from there. So again, just highlighting this thing about the interconnected world, the reliance on the internet, um, and, and in this case, the application itself or the, the system, the Fibber Watch almost became unusable or not usable in its normal state. Yeah, and I think an interesting point there too is we, we saw a recent outage around Google Maps as well where it's actually embedded into another platform. Uh, and I think it just highlights that, you know, it's not just your application, but it's APIs that you depend on or something like Google Maps where your page loads, but then a widget on your page or if you rely on Google Maps API or, you know, a different API for providing, you know, routing services or whatever it is, if you're reliant on that, a component of your application has failed. And we've seen this time and time again uh, now that we're so interdependent on different vendors. So that's why it's so important to not only monitor your application, uh, but your, you know, those that, that you rely on as well. Yeah, that's really important. And it goes back to a, best, the, the, a nice segue or closing theme around everything there. You know, we talked about understanding all these, uh, the, the, the interconnected dependencies around from there, but also any one component can actually sort of, you know, uh, uh, cause your problems. On the flip side of that, if we can identify where those components are, you can also give you those those um, areas where I can optimize my delivery and sort of make things better. Exactly. Well, thanks, Brian. As always, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and, you know, as we said, we could sort of wrap it on for this for, for hours and hours. Um, but, uh, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I'll definitely be back soon. That's our show. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow us on Twitter. As always, if you have any questions, feedback, either good, bad, or ugly, or guests you'd like to see featured on the show, just send us a note at internetreport at thousandice.com. So until next time, goodbye. Yeah.